Yep. Good morning and happy Earth Science Week. My name is Molly E. Hunt and I'm a geologist and the public information specialist for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Division of the Geological Survey. Today, we have an esteemed group of panelists who will share their career experiences with us. First, I will ask the panelists a series of prepared questions. Then towards the end of the hour, we will open up for questions by the audience. You can submit your questions anytime during the discussion by typing them in the comments section on Facebook or in the Q&A tab on Microsoft Teams. My colleagues Brittany Perrick and Chuck Sammons will be moderating our comment and question section. So without further ado, I would like to invite our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, their current position and their educational background. Let's begin with Dr. Wendy Bohan. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for that introduction, Molly. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, my current position, I am a communication specialist at NASA Goddard. I recently came uh, from the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, where I was the science communication specialist. And my educational background, I actually have uh, an undergraduate degree in theater, and then my master's degree and my PhD are in earthquake geology. So I study where earthquakes happen, why they happen, when they happen, and what we can do to prepare ourselves and the built environment for natural hazards. Chris? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Gordon. I'm a hydrogeologist at Egan & Associates. It's a small consulting firm in Worthington, Ohio. I graduated in, from Ohio State in 2006, which uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree uh, in Geological Sciences. I worked uh, from 2006, from two, 2006 to 2009 at the Division of Geological Survey, and then started working at Egan in 2009. I've been there for 13 years now. Great, Dr. Fakari. I'm Muhammad Fakari, a bedrock and structural geologist in Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Division of Geological Survey. I received my bachelor degree in geology a long time ago in 1971. While I was working in an oil company, I received my master's degree in geology in 1976 and received a PhD degree in structural geology and tectonics in 1996 and worked 30 plus years in oil companies. Now I'm working for almost 10 years in geological survey. Thank you. And Dr. Collery? Am I frozen? Oh, there I am. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm Dr. Caitlin Kaliri. I am the Assistant Curator of Vertebrate Paleontology at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Um, and my background, I have an undergrad in anthropology, and then I got a master's in paleobiology and a PhD in the geosciences. And my research is basically on how an animal becomes a fossil. Awesome. Well, thank you all for introducing yourself. So we're going to jump right into our questions. So Chris, I'm going to start out with you. Uh, describe your typical work day. What do you do on a daily basis? Uh, one of the aspects that I really enjoy about working at Egan is that I get to work on a variety of different projects. Uh, so what goes into each work day looks a little different uh, depending on that project. So Egan, we specialize in siting and monitoring of waste facilities, uh, investigation and remediation of aquifer contamination. Uh, we do groundwater modeling and mining and construction dewatering and residential well monitoring and impact mitigation that goes along with that. Um, while I get to work on all these projects, uh, probably my most enjoyable projects are groundwater supply, evaluation and well field management. So for instance, uh, a public water supply looking to expand their current capacity uh, or better understand the production capacity from their existing wells and their well fields uh, would consult Egan. Um, and these projects involve a, an initial desktop investigation uh, where we're compiling data 
from various publications, particularly uh, from the Geological Survey, uh, to gain an understanding of the, the regional hydrogeologic setting. And after we understand that a little better, uh, we'll then coordinate with well drilling contractors uh, to go out in the field uh, to perform any additional test drilling that might need to be done, uh, perform pumping tests uh, in order to help determine uh, aquifer properties that would help us provide recommendations based on the results of that analysis to our clients. Um, if I had to describe a typical work day, uh, it involves coming into the office, which we work mostly from the office nowadays, um, looking at my, my current projects and upcoming projects, uh, determining the deadlines that I have, <laughs> whether it's something I need to get done that day or if it's a regulatory deadline um, that Ohio EPA has established, um, communicating uh, with our clients, um, the laboratory, um, checking on the status of the results that are at the lab or identify and work through um, any potential quality control issues uh, where we're going to get back the reports, meeting and checking in with our field team. Are they running any issues out in the field? Uh, do they need my help with something back at the office? And, and then assist colleagues working through different problems they have, different projects they have. Um, and then finally, writing and submitting the reports based on all that work. Uh, the information we've collected to the clients and or the regulatory agencies. Thank you. Uh, Mohammed. what's your typical work day like? Yeah, usually I do just come off and look for emails or the projects that I'm going to do, but mainly I do research and do geological mapping for my projects using ArcGIS, Adobe Illustrator, Microsoft softwares, software applications. I go to the field and collect geological data like identifying rock, inform rock formations, their aerial distribution in the outcrops and geometric information like the pan strike of the layers, using GPS to identify and document exact location of the geological data. I do research and read previously published geological papers and reports to write an up-to-date new report or paper. I present geological studies, answer bedrock and structural geology questions for the public, since we work for the public and we are available for the public for their questions. Thank you. And Mohammed is go ahead, please. Mohammed is an author of many of our geologic guides to a lot of our local and state parks throughout the state. Um, so he does a lot of really great work on those. Um, Caitlin, what's your typical work day like? So I don't really feel like I've had a typical work day since I started because I started here at the museum in January 2020. Um, so it's all been, you know, a little COVID-y. Um, and we're also redoing all of our permanent galleries here at the museum. So that is the majority of what I spend my time on right now is working with the designers on um, making all new galleries, which is really exciting, but it is a lot of work and takes up a lot of time. Um, so the museum is basically under construction right now. We are writing the script, we're picking the specimens, we are um, doing the interactives, we're working with the media folks. So that's but basically the majority of my time right now is spent in Zoom meetings, it feels like. Um, but in general, a curator at a museum has a research program. Uh, I have a lab that I'm still setting up right now to do my research. Um, and I, I think my favorite thing about being a curator is that I have all of these fossils. Um, so when I'm procrastinating or, you know, doing something else, I can just go get lost in the collection and start pulling open drawers and see, see what's in there. That's awesome. And the Cleveland Museum is celebrating its 100th anniversary. Is that correct? Yep. 2020 um, was our 100th anniversary. So we're just kind of prolonging the celebration. That's awesome. We look forward to seeing what new exhibits will be coming. All right. Jumping over to, you know, NASA. Wendy, what is your typical day at NASA? I, like most other folks, I don't know that I have a typical day. I spend a lot of time uh, thinking. Sometimes I write things down, uh, <laughs> but I work a lot with um, the lab chiefs. 
that are at NASA because I work in the Earth Sciences Division and a lot of people are like, oh, you're at NASA, you must love space. I actually don't. Space kind of freaks me out, like space and deep water. But it turns out the Earth is also a planet, and so NASA does a lot of work studying the Earth using satellites, and then there are tons of scientists here that look at that data, use that data, and put that data together so we can understand how the Earth works as a system. Part of my job is making sure that people know that NASA studies the Earth and that people know what the data is and where to get it. So I do that externally, and then I work internally with our scientists to make sure that they know how to communicate their science to people, because nobody communicates science better than the people that are doing it. And so I want to make sure that they're able to do that and have the skills to be able to do that. And um, another big part of, of my days is doing social media, because as a person that studies hazards that affects people's lives, I think it's really important that we communicate um, the science that we know to the people that need it, whether it's teachers or congressmen or kindergartners, it doesn't matter. So I spend a lot of time making TikToks and putting things out on Facebook or on Twitter so that people can understand more about earthquakes and other rapid onset geologic hazards. And I do a lot of emails and meetings because that's like why you get paid, right? The fun stuff, you could do that as a volunteer, but nobody's going to sit in meetings for free. <laughs> Yeah, and Wendy, I think one time you and I were having a conversation and you said that this has always stuck with me that science isn't done until it's communicated. So it's really great, you know, all the work that you're doing. So you all are, you know, within your careers, but I'm curious, you know, what kind of experiences have inspired you all to pursue this career? So Mohammed, if you don't mind, we'll start out with you. What made you go into the geosciences? That's a nice question and lots of answer for that. First of all, my science teacher in high school was a geologist. He inspired me to the exciting geological world. But the most main reason for me to go to study geology was there was a big travertine rock mine producing huge red travertine blocks very close to my parents' orchard. So I was looking while in the orchard, I was looking, okay, they are taking out those big blocks and they are selling them. I thought, okay, I'll study geology and will own a mine and will get rich. <laughs> I studied geology, but never owned a mine. I'm very happy what I have done. And I found much more interesting, satisfying, and enjoyable work in geologic fields that I don't want to leave it even now after 50 years. That's a wonderful answer, yes. And we'll touch on that a little bit later, but that's wonderful to hear that you've been loving your career for over 50 years. Um, Caitlin, what about you? So I got started in anthropology, um, and so I was more or less interested in biological anthropology and creatures and bones. Um, so I started volunteering after undergrad at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, which is where I'm from, and it was there that they took me out on a dinosaur dig, and that was kind of it for me. That was just like the coolest thing ever, and I was like, I need to figure out how to spend the rest of my life doing this. Awesome. All right. Chris, what about you? Um, I don't know if I could say one particular experience, um, but I'd say as a whole, uh, my teachers and my professors and their love and passion for the sciences. Uh, I always enjoyed science classes all the way through high school. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, that my teachers always made me made me think and helped me realize that there was so much more to learn and understand in the science fields. Um, and I was fascinated by that prospect. Uh, when I started at Ohio State, I had a completely different major career path in mind. Uh, geological sciences wasn't even on my radar. Um, so I was struggling to, to really stay engaged, started losing interest in my classes that I was taking. Um, and as luck would have it, fortune would have it, beginning of my sophomore year, uh, I chose physical geology as, as one of my science prerequisites. 
And, and, and I'll credit that class with turning my college career around. Um, on top of the subject matter that I was obviously interested in, um, I credit my professor being being so relatable and engaging uh, for kickstarting that that passion that I once had for the sciences and geology in particular. That's excellent. Yeah, mentors in geology play such an important role in, in developing those career ideas, especially you know when you're younger, you know, in, in the high school, into college. Um, Wendy, how about you? Uh, you said that you have an undergrad in theater. How did you become a geologist? Yeah, it's uh, it's a little circuitous, but you know what? That's OK. You don't have to know what you're going to do when you grow up right away. Uh, you know, I was a, a theater major and I did take some geology classes um, and ended up getting a geology minor just because I thought it was cool. I had done caving as a kid and, you know, always sort of wondered why there were shells underneath a mountain hundreds of miles away from the ocean. So I had the curiosity. But I didn't identify as a scientist at all. I was very much an artist. I, you know, I was an actress. I did a lot of like porcelain tiles. I mean, all sorts of weird stuff. Anyway, I moved to LA because I had an offer to be in a movie and I didn't want to get a real job. So I was like, LA sounds fun. Let's do that. And I was a professional actress for several years. And then the Hector Mine earthquake happened. So that was a magnitude 7.1 earthquake out in the desert. It was felt widely across Southern California. And I was like, holy mackerel that was amazing so i went and volunteered at the usgs earthquake hazards program which is on the caltech campus people often confuse who they are and what they do but they do work collaboratively and after i was there a little while they were like you know you're actually kind of good at this because you know geology and you like to talk to people so you want to work here and i was like okay uh and after i guess i was there almost seven years as the outreach and education coordinator for southern california and then I decided that I really loved the impact that I could make because I could actually make a difference. I could use all these different skill sets and all these different things that I had learned, but I, I needed to know more about the science. And so that's when I went back and decided that this was the path I wanted to take. That's excellent. And I think it's a, an extra point to bring up that even if you're interested in geosciences, you don't necessarily have to maybe be a geologist to work within the geosciences. Here at the Ohio Geological Survey, we have several staff members that are not geologists, but they're very important members of our team and they are learning geology along with the rest of us. So that's excellent um, to share that point. So you guys all have such a maybe a little bit of a different educational background, um, but outside of you know academics, what experiences prepare you for your current career? Um, we can start with Caitlin. So I think one of the big ones for me was volunteering. Um, I spent, after undergrad, I spent two years at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles uh, volunteering. I actually had three jobs to support my volunteer habit at that time for two years. Um, and that was how I got a lot of experience. Um, I learned so much while I was there. And like Wendy said, like you get to do the most of what you love while you're volunteering. And that really was the case for me, for sure. I got to go out on dinosaur digs. I got left alone in the dinosaur collection, just to, like pull open drawers and learn about all of the random creatures that were in there. Um, so I think that that was a really good experience. And that was how I started meeting people, um, because I think that you have to really build up a network of people, um, not only to have collaborators or your colleagues, but also mentors and people like that. Um, just so you know you find out about opportunities and things like that so i think that that really helped me um and then i did some internships uh i took i took a year two years to volunteer at the natural history museum between undergrad and my master's and then i did a year in between my master's and my phd um and i did internships in there and i think that that was also a really good experience um again, getting like that hands-on experience working with fossils. Um, and yeah, again, meeting people and really expanding my circle. Yeah, and I'll echo that. I had a very similar experience with the volunteerships and the internships, and that truly, you know, set me on fire for interest. Um, Chris, we'll pop over to you. You know, what kind of experiences did you have that helped prepare you for your career? Um. There we are. <laughs> Taking a minute to get off mute there. Um, yeah, I was 
really thinking about this question throughout throughout my life. I've been involved in various groups and clubs that have helped me develop organizational and leadership skills. Um, but thinking about how to answer this question, I, I, I kept thinking of one specific experience early on actually in my career. Um, I had the opportunity um, and I, I was super excited about it. I got to write an article in one of the survey publications um, based on what I was working on at the time. Um, however, after it was published, uh, I received some pretty humbling criticism to say the least uh, from a viewpoint that I hadn't even considered when I was writing it. Um, in the moment, it, it was really, really difficult to navigate. Um, I, I was devastated, honestly, at the time, because uh, it was it was one of the first times in my life that I had I had, <laughs> I had, had that type of feedback before. Um, but looking back on that experience now, um, I, I think that experience helped shape how I approach projects in my career and, and honestly, even in my life. Um, I'm able to, I try to take a step back and, and look at the big picture, not be so narrow focused if I'm trying to write something. Um, and so I could better understand what I'm actually trying to say when I'm writing. Um, and, and now I understand I don't have to do things on my own. Um, I try to use my resources. I'm seeking input of colleagues uh, and my mentors. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to be willing to accept their guidance and advice um, to help shape my own ideas. Um, and I think if you can if you can do that, it might help you better understand different viewpoints that you might not have been thinking about originally um, and versus trying to do things yourself. So seek seek help, <laughs> seek guidance. Yeah, that, that was an excellent response. Thank you. Um, Wendy, how about you? Yeah, I would say the there's a lot of things that have helped me in my career that I can group them into two areas. One is being willing to try new things and the other one is being willing to bring my whole self into what I do. So when I think about, you know, my career in science, I never thought I was going to be a scientist. I hated math. I always struggled with math until I had something to apply it to. But my theater skills, my public speaking skills, the way I've learned to write, that creative side of who I am has really been helpful in my scientific endeavors. Because again, you're not going to get a grant funded if you can't communicate to somebody why your idea is important. You can't write a paper like Chris was talking about if you can't actually write the words down so people can understand them. So having that creative side, I was able to learn the math, but I can bring that together, which was really helpful. And then being open minded, like I had to be able to go to the USGS and like ask to do a thing I didn't know if I could do. And they let me try. And when I was in grad school, um, you, you can get paid different ways in grad school. One of the things that they paid me to do, they were like, we want you to do social media for this geophysical project. And I was like, no, I'm a quantitative scientist. I don't do social media, like what? And I started doing it and I was like, oh my gosh, this is such an opportunity to get science to people in a new way. And oh my God, look, I can bring all of this theater stuff. I can make videos. I can do all these other things and bring myself into that. And so that's a huge part of my work now is disseminating science through those particular platforms. So I would say the big things are like keeping an open mind and then making sure that you bring all of your talents and skills and finding ways to apply them to your job. Yeah, wonderful. All right, we'll end this question with Mohammed. Uh, I'm a nature lover and my hobby is hiking and mountain climbing. I've used lots of rock climbing even. I'm sorry that I miss them all in Ohio, but it helped me very much doing my job easily and joyfully. I enjoy going to the field and doing geology hiking, walking up the cliffs to see that what's going on. It's like my hobby. It's not a job. It's just I enjoy every day doing that. It's good to do. It's actually good to do the job that you love and get paid <laughs> and also bring something out and some publications that people, everybody can enjoy that. It's really 
interesting and I love it. I I'm so happy that I loved my work and I produce so many maps, geological maps that people they use and they say, OK, this is made by. By Muhammad long, long time ago and also these days that I am making these geology guides for the parks and I'm sure that Ohioans will enjoy them. So that's my reason for having this job actually hiking geology, going to the field or traveling. It inspired me to go to do my job as I like it. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, people who, who like the outdoors, you know, geosciences is a perfect career field for you. Um, we don't always get to be in the field every day. It does kind of depend on your job, but like Mohammed said, you know, there are definitely times where you'll be scaling walls and knowing how to do that and how to do it safely is always incredibly important. So moving to a little bit of a, a different kind of question, um, has there ever been a particularly challenging moment um, or a project in your career and and how did you overcome those those maybe difficult moments? Caitlin? So I think the most challenging part of my career so far has been how much I've had to move around. Um, so I left LA in 2012, so it's been like 10 years um, since I've lived close to my family and I've been all over the place. I've moved probably a dozen times in the last 10 years um, and that's been part of the adventure of it and part of the excitement of it, but it's also been difficult because you really, you know, it's hard to make friends and maintain friendships and relationships. And it's cool having friends like actually all over the world now, which is really nice. So like I can go visit them and see them and stuff. Um, but it is really difficult um, just moving around all the time and having to just like pick up and go. So I think that that has been the greatest struggle that I've had so far. Um, and now that I'm in a permanent position, it's really nice because I can actually like settle down a little bit. So just getting used to that feeling of not having to pick up and go again has been really great. And you're in Cleveland and you've got, I mean, Ohio's beautiful. You're right by the lake and you've got all the wonderful museums. So yeah, hopefully I, you'll stay here for a while. We're, we're happy to have Cleveland. you in Ohio. I absolutely love Cleveland. <laughs> all right. Mohammed, what about you? Is there anything that was challenging or maybe a project that was just really difficult? Uh, working for 50 years, they might be something, but I didn't have a big challenge challenging point in my work and duties that's I'm pretty sure about that because I was all the time working much more than you know expected but I had challenges about extra work and doing more than expectation that was my problem as a structural geologist I I was doing about 30 years ago I was responsible for making underground maps for the possible oil and gas fields to locate the best points for exploration wells. Since I was collecting field data and doing geology, I began prepare, preparing geological maps beside of my regular work duties. It was very satisfying for me to have several published maps and my name was there. I was young. I said, OK, this guy is doing this one and that one, but it was not OK for the other colleagues that they were working only for their paychecks. So it was not uh, good for them because it said, OK, this guy is doing this one, that one, but the others are not doing that. So they found a way to stop my mapping work for two years. They convinced the administration that they shouldn't be, there isn't what the point that they found that they shouldn't be a name on their maps. It should be because it is making by, you know, in the office. So, but that was a challenging point for me. So they stopped my working, which was a kind of, you know, joyful work for me beside of the, my duties. But fortunately, it was OK with new administration and I could continue my mapping and authored 18 more geological maps. So that was the only challenging point. But other than that, I was very happy and I think everybody 
remembers me and so for my hard work. Yeah, definitely. You're one of the hardest working people I know. Um, Wendy, how about you? I think my biggest challenge almost always is getting out of my own way. You know, I identified as a artist for so long that I didn't ever think anybody would take me seriously as a scientist. And so it was hard for me to put myself out there in that way. Although I was debating saying that or there was this one project I was working on for my PhD and I was looking at the Karakoram fault system in India in between uh, India, Pakistan and China. So there's a lots of lots of places you can't go either because the mountains are too tall or because their countries are at war. So, you know, can't go to those places and there were no good geological maps. And so I couldn't actually figure out how to do what I needed to do because in the field there were limited places that I could go, but I needed to map the whole area to understand the geologic context. And I was like, I could not figure out what I was going to do. And so I'm lamenting this to my roommate and her boyfriend and a couple other people. And he was like, why don't you just use Aster data? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he goes, well, he worked in a different department. He was like, well, we have a, a satellite that circles the Earth that's very similar to a satellite that circles Mars. And, you know, we map the surface of Mars with that satellite, the minerals, so you can infer the geology from that. Why don't you just do that with the Aster satellite? And I was like, I didn't know that was a thing. Can we do that? And he was like, sure. I was like, but I don't know how to do that. And he was like, that's okay. I do and we can work together and so we ended up publishing a paper together on how we map these rocks from space and so that was like a big moment for me i didn't have to know how to do everything right as long as you know people and have a good network of people you can work together science is not a single endeavor it's not one person doing a thing it's a network of people working together to create and understand new things so that was a big moment yeah, and it sounds like, you know, something kind of incredible came out of that challenge. That's really interesting. I didn't know that you could do that. Um, Chris, we'll, we'll round off this question with you. So I had mentioned in my, my previous answer um, that I'd received some feedback early on in my career. Um, and it just so happened it was the, the same time. It was the same time as the 2008 recession. Um, so that that affected me both personally and professionally, as it did a lot of people. Um, having those si situations coincide uh, made me sort of step back and reevaluate my career path. Uh, I was experiencing some uncertainty and, and needed some guidance. I was just really second guessing myself. Um, so I took that time to reach out uh, to the various connections I had um, from my time at Ohio State. Um, from those that I worked with in close at the survey, um, at the Ohio Geological Society I was a member of, um, and friends and family uh, for their advice and guidance. Um, and ultimately, I decided I needed I needed a change uh, to reinvigorate my my passion for the geosciences. Um, and I but I wanted to work for a company that aligned with my values and was also respected in the geological community. Um, so I ended up joining Egan Associates. And I'm working there for 13 years now, um, but I, I I think it was the connections. Going back to my previous answer, the connections I had made and the support group I had of colleagues, friends and family uh, that helped me overcome that that challenge at that time and the uncertainty I had at that point in my career. Yeah, and I think all of you have you know touched on this, just having some kind of community you know, moving into your career is very important, making those connections, having a network. Um, you know, I, I kind of echo all of your answers and how important that is. So our attendees, you know, I encourage you if you're interested in, you know, these kind of careers, seek out mentors, seek out friends, seek out colleagues. Um, they really truly will help you get through. Um, and I do want to mention as we're getting to about halfway through, um, if you have any questions, you know, for our panelists, you're welcome to put those in the Q&A section here on Microsoft. Um, or if you're on our Facebook Live, you can put those in the comments below. Um, but I've got one more question for all of you. Um, what words of encouragement or advice would you give a young person, maybe someone in high school, um, who's interested in a career in the geosciences? Wendy, let's start out with you. My advice is just to know that you belong there. If it's something you're curious about, if it's something you're interested in, you can learn the skills that go along with that. So don't let anybody tell you or make you feel like you don't belong in those spaces, because if you think you belong, 
then you belong. Chris? All right, finally. <laughs> My unmute button is not working very quick today. Uh, like Molly had just said, don't be afraid to reach out to, to the professionals and your professors um, to, to ask questions. If you're not sure of what area you want to specialize in, but you have an interest in the geosciences, there are a lot of people out there that have studied and become subject experts on a variety of topics. I mean, I look at look at my counterparts on this panel. I mean, they are the experts in their field. Don't be afraid to reach out to them uh, for advice and for knowledge. And I'll, I'll bet most everyone would be happy to provide you with some guidance. Um, get involved in professional societies. Um, many of them have free or, or discounted student membership fees. Um, listen to webinars, attend events. And you're, you're, if you're here listening to this right now, you're, you're doing the right thing. Um, continue to do that. Uh, you might just hear a talk on a subject or, or field that wasn't even on your radar. So continue, continue to, to stay involved and reach out. Yeah, great answer. All right, Caitlin, what about you? What advice would you give? Um, so I think it's important to be open to opportunities that you might not even expect. Like there's a chance that you start on your career path, like working towards a very specific goal. Um, but I think it's important to be open to surprises and open to that, like evolving and changing over time. Um, for me, the hardest part of my PhD was like the very end where I was trying to finish everything up, but then also figure out what I was going to go do next. And I got some really good advice from someone who told me that people with PhDs will always have job opportunities. And I think that that really gave me this idea of even if it's not exactly how I imagined it, I will be fine. <laughs> like I will find something that I love and that I'm passionate about. Um, and I think that goes for anybody. You don't need to have a PhD for that to be true. Like if you really love the geosciences, there's always a little niche in there for you to find. Um, and I think that I also think it's so, so, so important to just be kind to yourself throughout the entire process, um, prioritizing self care and your mental health and really like keeping up with the things that you love and not just getting like enveloped by this thing that you feel like has to be your passion um, and just having other things also going on in your life is very important. Mental health is, is very important. Um, Mohammed, what about you? What kind of you know encouragement or advice would you give maybe you know someone in high school or even your, your younger self? Yeah, if you are interested in geology, and you are a nature lover, you will be a successful geologist. As long if you want, you will do that. Go out to the field, to the parks, take photographs from the geology, from the rocks, collect rocks and fossil samples, learn about the geology of the city or area that you live on it. It will encourage you to see a little bit more. Search online for geology, geology features, Check and learn about the rocks you may see in this park, sidewalks, or buildings. Search online about the geology features to, to see how they form. It is, it is be jo a joyful hobby and helpful tool for geoscience career. Fortunately, these days, you know, everything is online. It is really easy to learn and you know study about all the sciences especially geosciences with lots of beautiful features and pictures photographs explanations and if you check them you look at them you will find more interesting subjects and will encourage you going to the geoscience and get hired and have a career for that i remember that the question in, in the past, I had from my the younger geologists that they were going to, you know, hired in our organization or departments that I was working. I was as an interviewer. I my question was that okay, what's going around the city that you live? If they knew a little about this city, the geology of the city or the area that they live, it means that he or she is. A 
interested geologist. He he likes geology. He'll work for for the company, for the organization that I'm I'm just hiring this guy. So if he had no idea about the geology of the surrounding, it means that okay, he just got a degree to have some job. But you know, that's my point. Just if you are going to be a successful geoscientist and have a career, do whatever you want nearby you. Just in, don't let any rock your surroundings be checked. Just check it to see that what's going on. Is it sedimentary rocks or igneous rock or metamorphic? Where is this coming from? Is it from Ohio or is it from, you know, somewhere in, in the area that you live or deep underground? So all of them just will help you as a, you know, just successful geoscientist and find a good career. Yeah, and if you're on our webinar and you are from Ohio, visiting the our website, the Ohio Geological Survey, um, is very helpful to learn a little bit more about the geology of where you're from. So thank you all for answering these questions that were geared toward all of you. Um, I have additional questions for each of you, but I do want to remind our audience one more time that after this, we will be taking questions from you. So feel free to put those in the Q&A section on Microsoft Teams or in the comments on Facebook Live. So Mohammed, I'm going to jump back to you, um, but you've had the opportunity to work both in the United States and abroad. Um, how have these really unique experiences contributed to having a career that's expanded past 50 years? Yeah, just working you know, in the geoscience, if you do geology, almost everywhere is the same. Geology is everywhere the same. I remember that while just moving from one place to other place, some of my colleagues say that, okay, you don't know about the geology of that place. You, you don't know about geology of you know, Ohio or United States. So uh, what are you going to do? But I don't think that that's correct. I said, okay, geology is the same like mathematics, but a little different. You have to find out and enjoy that. The main reason that my work actually longevity is my passion to geoscience. Yeah, my passion. Working as a geologist in different geographic locations with different geologic specifications, I was able to see more and different geological environment and enjoy new geological features of the world, which still I love that. So seeing more, from it doesn't matter from Asia or Middle East or Europe or United States. It is just as long as much as you see, you will love it. Yeah, so any opportunity to travel and see geology is always an excellent way to continue, you know, to learn more. Wendy, I know you are a very proud mother of three. Um, how do you balance work and family life and what would you maybe See to encourage other parents who are in STEM fields. Uh, how do I balance work and family life? Not very well. I don't know that anybody really balances things too well. And when I think about balance, what I think about, I used to think that meant like you had it all figured out. But if you really think about what balancing is, it's having constant adjustments. You're constantly adjusting what you're doing and how you're doing it to accommodate the needs at hand. And so, you know, I have. I have little kids, I have big kid, and they are sick all the time. And so I have been lucky to be in a career where I can have flexible work times. That's a benefit of what I do. You know, I don't have to work a nine to five every day if my kids need something. Um, I'm able I'm able to be there. The other thing is um, reframing, right? I have to ask myself sometimes, do I want to live my resume or my eulogy? So what's more important to me? The things that I can put on my CV that make me look like a great scientist or the things that people would say at my funeral about me being a great person. And that that's a balance, right? Because my job pays the bills that allows me to do the other things. But it's important to keep both of those things in mind so that you can keep that balance because I love my job. I love what I do. I think it's impactful. I think it's important for the world. And so I can often get caught up in that. And I have to remember that 
there's a lot of people that can do the job that I do, but there's only my my kids only have one mom. And so I have to focus on that and make sure that gets equal billing in my life. Excellent. Caitlin, so you are the curator at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. So with that being a nonprofit, how has your experience with nonprofit work um, maybe differed from what we see in a private or public institution? So my experience has been at universities um, when I was in grad school, and then I started go working at natural history museums. Um, I did my postdoc at the Smithsonian, and then I came to Cleveland. So I really kind of contrast the two, and the major difference, as a curator, you have a research program. Um, you do research, that's a, a large portion of my job. Um, however, the main difference, I think, between being at a university and being at a museum is that um, the teaching is basically replaced with education and outreach um, through the museum itself. Um, so we do that in a lot of different ways, whether it's exhibits um, or if we do things like we're work working with the public directly. Um, and so I personally love that. Um, I like teaching. Teaching is great, um, but I think that the more informal education is definitely um, more my speed. Um, I like to just talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. I like to get to show people fossils as well and just like have that sort of like experience and it's really cool working for a mission-driven organization because you really do feel like you're you're doing something and you're a part of something. That's great. Um, Chris, so you are someone who probably spends you know a decent amount of time in the field um, how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect your work with the groundwater resources? Uh, our company relies on our field work and our field personnel. And while I, I might not be going out as much as I used to uh, when I first started out, um, our field personnel are out in the field all the time, whether it's for installing monitoring wells, developing those wells, uh, testing them, um, sampling those wells, or, or or logging new holes that are being put in the ground, performing pumping tests. Um, and then more importantly, it's the collaboration that we rely on to complete the projects. Collaboration between the field personnel that are going out getting the work done and everyone back at the office, that communication, collaboration when everyone gets back. So needless to say, the year uh, 2020 uh, definitely had us concerned that the, our routine way of of communicating and doing things was going to get disrupted um, and that we weren't going to be able to provide our clients um, with the with with what they needed. Um, so but we set up everyone for remote work. Uh, we found a way to keep working through remote collaboration um, and, and the need to effectively communicate with each other. Um, a lot of our work actually takes place in Ohio. Most of our work does or in the surrounding states. Um, it's mandated through regulations set by Ohio EPA. So we were fortunate uh, to be able to continue to work out in the field during 2020. Um, hotels stayed open. Uh, we didn't have to worry about flying anywhere. Um, so when, when the way our field work works now um, is the same as what it was before. We typically drive by ourselves and work in small groups, um, but sort of uh, separately on each site. Um, and but we also did establish new safety protocols because of 2020, um, which we still use today. And that whole experience has helped us be a little more mobile and probably a little more efficient as a company as a whole. Excellent. Um, I just got to say, wow, I've just been so inspired by you know the achievements and experiences and words of encouragement you all have shared with us today. Um, but I do believe it is now time for some excellent audience questions. So I'm going to check our Q&A here. See, oh, we've got lots of questions. So the first one is, um, and feel free for any of you to jump in, uh, but how do I get involved in research as an undergrad or science? Um, my college doesn't require an undergraduate thesis. There is some things sponsored by the National Science Foundation called Research Experiences for Undergraduates. And you can go on the NSF website and find a list of all of those different internships. They are paid internships in a variety of different fields. Um, we used to offer one in seismology. It was really, really amazing. So there's lots of stuff out there that will actually 
you know, pay you to get research as an undergrad. Yeah, and we will be sure to add a link um, into the chat. I'll have Chuck do that as we go. In addition to that, I would say um, just get on your school's website and look for the labs and figure out which one has research that you'd be interested in, especially if it has graduate students in the lab. I know that graduate students are usually really happy to take researchers or undergraduate researchers into their uh, labs and teach them how to do research um, and bring them in on their projects. Yeah, also seeking out you know, an independent study with one of your professors, that's also an excellent way to get involved. Um, just because your college doesn't require a thesis, uh, you could still do one. Let's see, we've got another question. Um, do you ever feel like you aren't confident about the things you do in your job? Um, I'm a newer geologist and I sometimes feel like I lack confidence. Imposter syndrome is a thing. Every day. Yeah, I do so yeah. many things in my job that I wasn't trained to do, um, and it really is just kind of figuring it out as I go along. I'm if very confident in my job. I think that, OK, this is the one that I see. Nobody can see that. So maybe that's from my experience, but it's if you get you need to get confident and just do a little bit of research and what you see just you should be comfortable with what you are doing. Yeah, yeah and I'll, I'll kind of you know add on there too. as a new geologist, you know, fresh out of school and, and here at the Ohio Survey, I ask lots of questions that, you know, thankfully I have a great team behind me um, that's very willing to help me. So don't be afraid to ask questions and admit when you don't know what you're doing. I think, you know, instead of taking the opportunity to maybe mess something up or do something incorrectly, it's it's better to ask questions or, you know, maybe ask before you have to ask for forgiveness. But, you know, just the more you get into it, I think the more confidence you'll have. But that was an, an excellent question. So we've got another question that says I need I need to ask add actually a sentence for that subject. You know, just after I think after 50 years of work or 54 years of in geology, it's still, I think that I need to learn more and more. I ask questions from even younger people, younger staff, younger geologists. They they may know more than me about some other subjects. Asking questions is the good point. When you stop your asking questions, you are almost, you know, end of it. You should ask all the time and learn more and more and more. Definitely. All right, so do you ever help? So within your organizations, do any of you ever help hire people um, or, you know, what are some things that maybe companies are, are looking for in a potential, you know, geologist hire? So I can answer that in terms of the research experiences for undergrads, which I help to select the candidates for that. And we weren't looking for the people that had the best grades. We weren't looking for the people that were the most like they'd done every internship and knew everything. What we were looking for were people that had enough understanding of the subject matter to be successful and that showed an ability to like get knocked down and get back up. You know, people that had maybe had some hardships, people that had some life experience, you know, people that weren't necessarily like went straight from a prep school into a college. You know, we were looking for people because science can be hard. There's a lot of failure involved. You have to be able to be like, gosh, I thought that was going to work. It didn't work. What can I do now? What else can I do? You have to have grit. And so we were looking for just the ability to do stuff and also the grit to get it done. Because we know, I think, there's a recognition now that oftentimes people's resumes or CVs will tell you about their opportunities, not their abilities. So. Yeah, I mentioned as I mentioned within the other questions in the past, just while interviewing the geologists, I think that, you know, I I was thinking about one point that person that who is going to be hired need to be you know, interested in the job, interested in the work and doing the job done, just not for having a, a, a degree as a, you know, a scientist, whatever, a ge geologist or any other subjects. 
So as long as he knows, as he understands, he likes to do the job, that's the main point. So as a geoscientist, as I said, you should know almost at least about beside of your studying in, you know, in, in the, whatever you study during the courses, you should know a little bit more than that and as a hobby. So the, the person that you hires you, okay, says, okay, this person is interested in geology and it, he will work or he, she, she will work for me. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to add something. I'm, I'm not typically involved with the hiring its process itself. Um, but I've been around for a few years. Most most of our hires, actually majority of our hires, are uh, Bachelor of Science degree, Bachelor uh, Bachelor of Arts degree in Geological Sciences. Um, and what I've been able to tell is the most successful uh, employees are the ones that are, are willing to ask the questions. They know that they don't know everything. Um, and so that passion comes through with them wanting to learn more specifically on the job. Well, thank you. Uh, that was our, our last audience question, um, but I want to sincerely thank you, Wendy, Mohammed, Chris, and Caitlin for serving as our panelists today. Um, we really appreciate your time and your willingness to share your stories. So to our audience, uh, thank you for taking the time out of your day to, to tune in. Um, a recording of this webinar will be made available following today on YouTube at Ohio DNR under the Geology Playlist. And speaking of careers, uh, the Ohio Geological Survey is currently seeking a geologist too to join our groundwater resources group. So applications for this position will be taken through October 16th, um, and we'll share a link to that in our chat. We invite you to continue the celebration of our Science Week um, by visiting our Facebook page and our website to learn more about the geology of Ohio and the many events and programs uh, that we are hosting. We hope to see you at one of our events. Um, thank you again for joining, and we hope you have a wonderful Earth Science Week. Thank you. Thank you.